In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. So this time of year reminds me of a long, long season of my life uh, that I spent working as a camp counselor year after year. Um, and as I read today's gospel, I thought of one particular summer and one particular session. I was leading a bike trip. And our bike trip went from Surrey, Virginia, to, Williams, to, to Jamestown, to Yorktown, to Williamsburg, uh, and back to Surrey. Um, and then we had one a, a day trip to get our, our children ready to get their legs under them, and we went just about 10 miles down to a local pool. Um, and I remember at the pool, there was a, a little girl on the diving board uh, with tears streaming down her face, and, and I asked her what's wrong, and she said she dropped her toy uh, to the bottom of the deep end. And... Uh, uh, feeling a little heroic, I just said I would go get it, and I jumped in and uh, uh, quickly went and got um, uh, the toy and got back up, and something popped uh, in my ear, and so I spent the rest of the week with a ruptured eardrum. <laughs> Not to be dissuaded, I still felt heroic enough to carry about half of everybody's supplies uh, on my back as we rode in the, in the searing heat and had some sort of heat rash form all over my back. Uh, but I still wasn't done. Um, about the second day in, we're camping out, and um, one of the uh, uh, children, one of the youth in our, uh, in our group, um, on his medical thing, he said he had ADHD, and, uh, but the, he was off medication for the summer, which they often did, even though the prerequisite for a counselor is, uh, uh, is far beneath that of a parent or a teacher or anybody else who might have uh, more uh, extensive experience uh, with, with handling uh, a, a, ch a child who's off their medication. Uh, so I remember I'm sitting here getting ready to cook dinner on one of those old Col Coleman uh, grills, and you have to pump it at the same time as you, as you put the lighter on, you know, uh, and he's fidgeting with it, and I, and I just gently say, please don't do that, thinking that would be sufficient. Uh, and as I go to pump it, he flips the top that opens up, and gas comes spewing out <laughs> as I light it, and my hand goes up in flames. So it's a, <laughs> Um, and so I'm looking at myself, covered in gasoline, uh, and my hand on fire, trying to figure out how to get this hand out off. Um, you know, so I'm beating it against a tree until I finally uh, get the flames uh, to, to go away, and I go to the doctor, and they wrap me up, and uh, I look like a mash unit at this point. Uh, but when I got back to camp at the end of the week, all of my fellow counselors had quite a bit of sage advice uh, for how I should have handled the situation. Uh, they, they said things like, don't you remember the stop, drop, and roll? Um, or any of other countless uh, bits of feedback about how I might have handled this better. But one of the truths is that when we are in an anxious uh, moment, we don't always have our best instincts. When we are uh, in a situation that induces fear uh, or anxiety, usually we struggle to respond as calmly and as rationally as we might otherwise. I have seen people who are beyond articulate. Some of the brightest people uh, that you have ever seen uh, put in front of a group of people and they can't connect sentences. Or an incredible swimmer uh, who when uh, they're in the water and all of a sudden they swallow a little bit of, of, of water, they forget uh, all of their instincts and they have that feeling like they're sinking uh, and then they start uh, moving their hands and feet as fast as they can uh, until somebody helps them uh, regain that, um, uh, that equilibrium, that sense of calm. Uh, we don't always respond at our best when we are afraid. It's true. We've done damage to relationships because of our fears. Some of the most egregious things we've done as a nation or as a people have been born out of fear, out of our anxieties and our fears. God knew that about us. God knew that our fears inhibited us from being able to connect with the God uh, who is love, who is grace, who is hope, who is reconciliation, and wanted so much to make sure that fear didn't cut off those channels that are so desperate to us living the life that we're intended to live. Our three- and four-year-olds uh, uh, already uh, in the course of chapel, uh, by the end of the year, uh, whenever an angel appears in any of the Bible stories that we tell, uh, I can say to them after the angels appeared, what do you think the angel said? And their hands will all go up and they'll say, do not be afraid. 
They know that's about the first thing that every angel that appears in the Bible says. It's one of the first things that Jesus usually says. Do not be afraid. It's easier said than done sometimes. But the truth is, our fear inhibits so much of the best of us. And one of the big responsibilities of, of, of us as people is to get beyond fear, to react differently. And it's not easy. And we have that story, uh, that beautiful story of David and Goliath, that story of that ruddy child. And I can hardly relate to that story. I have to tell you, if put in the same uh, situation uh, where they're looking for volunteers to uh, fight a 10-foot uh, a giant uh, whose basic vocation since childhood uh, has been uh, destroying other people, I probably wouldn't raise my hand. I am absolutely amazed by this story. It almost is unrelatable in his incredible courage uh, and his ability to trust God without fear. And I have no idea how he does it. I mean, he's amazing. He says, well, you know, I've been uh, responsible for my, my dad's uh, sheep, and, uh, and I've taken care of them, and sometimes a bear or a lion has come after him, and, uh, and God's equipped me with everything I need. I've taken my slingshot, or I've, uh, I've, I've beaten them off, and I've saved the lamb, so there's no reason that God wouldn't do the same when going up against a 10-foot giant. And one of the really funny scenes in, uh, uh, in, in, in the Old Testament is this image of David. Uh, this ruddy young boy uh, dressed to the nines in armor, uh, so weighed down he can hardly walk, uh, and then thinking to himself, this probably isn't going to work very well for me. Uh, I need to fight this giant on my own terms, and I know that God will equip me with everything I need. I don't need this armor. And he does, and he's successful. A little more relatable is the story of the disciples. That story makes a little bit more sense because I can see myself uh, when the storm clouds come uh, and the skies open up uh, thinking to myself, we're all going to die. This is it. This is how it all ends. Uh, we should have checked a weather app before we got out on the water today, but uh, uh, there, that's going to be in my obituary. I didn't check the weather that afternoon. Uh, but these disciples are all out there in a boat, and they feel like this is it. They are going to perish. And they don't even wake Jesus up to say, Jesus, save us, save us. Uh, they don't even really believe that Jesus has that kind of capacity yet. They're still new uh, in their relationship with Jesus. And so they say, Jesus, uh, why did you bring us out here just to die out here? And he chastises their faith, which I think is a little unfair. I mean, these disciples have dropped everything. We're only four chapters into the story, uh, and they've left their families, their livelihood. Uh, they've left their religious communities, essentially. Uh, they have gone out, and they've been ridiculed for it. Uh, and Jesus hasn't really delivered a whole lot. He's told a few parables. Uh, he's done one small little healing story, but not enough for them to realize the magnitude of who it is that they are in the boat with. Uh, and they are afraid. They're petrified. And Jesus, asleep in the back, uh, they wake him up and say, are, is this how we're all going to perish? Why are we perishing like this? This can't be your plan. Uh, Jesus calms the waters and says, ye of little faith, where was your faith? I think what Jesus is really concerned about is not that they didn't have enough faith, but that they didn't have all of the tools to be able to channel that faith when they needed it most. That's a critical difference. How do we channel that faith when we need it most? Not when the seas are calm, but when they're turned upside down. How do we push aside fear? How do we push aside doubt and hold on to that faith that we desperately need? You know, people who deal with fear all the time are trained uh, pretty specifically about how to deal with that fear whether it's uh, firefighters or police officers or special forces, uh, they learn how to deal with fear. One, you prepare, you prepare, you prepare, and then you prepare again. For any scenario you can possibly come across, you prepare. And Jesus is doing that. Jesus sends the disciples out two by two. Uh, he is creating scenarios in which they are confronting their fears uh, and the limits of their faith. So that when Jesus isn't with them, it'll hold. And we see that it does through prison, 
uh, through all kinds of issues after Jesus uh, has given them the gift of the Holy Spirit. Another tool is to breathe. Breathe. I mean, it makes sense. You learn it in yoga. You learn it uh, in all different varieties of life. Uh, but to be able to breathe deeply, for the disciples to be able to self-differentiate from all the things around them and just to breathe in God's spirit and to trust in that truth, to be able to take that calm amidst the storm. Another thing they say that uh, folks that train for this uh, do is that they have to speak louder in their heads than the voice that naturally comes in, the voice that says, you're going to peril. This is not going to end well. This could end in calamity. You need to have louder voices in your head, whether it's the words of Jesus, texts of the scripture, your favorite hymn. There has to be something that is hopeful, that is assuring, that speaks to you louder than your fears and doubts that speak in the back of your head. Another thing that people who are in fear regularly depend on is meditation. How do you find a prayer life that invites you to find that calm, that invites you to go to a place of tranquility and calm <clears throat> and ability to, to take out everything that is outside of yourself and to be still when a storm is all around you? And so Jesus models that with his life of prayer. So I don't think Jesus is criticizing them for a lack of faith, but he's teaching them. You are going to desperately need all of those mustard seeds of faith, those instruments that I give you, so that you can go out and be the people you are called to be, so that you can make hope-filled decisions, so that you can be God's children, God's instruments in the world. You know, Jesus doesn't just send them out uh, across this time. Uh, there's one other occasion uh, where he sends them out, and it's, it's worth knowing that when they go out across the Sea of Galilee, it's not just the risk of afternoon storms coming up, uh, but they are going to a different people, to people that don't look like them, that don't worship like them, that have different uh, beliefs and ideas, uh, places where people, uh, they don't know each other. They don't understand them, and there's... a immediate fear at that, but they still go across. And the other time that Jesus sends them across, he sends them without them. He sends them alone, and a storm again comes up. This time, Jesus appears to them walking on the water, and he calms the waters again, and he says, come to me. And Peter starts to walk to him, and he can walk on water until he realizes he's walking on water, then all of a sudden, he starts to sink because he's not focused on Jesus anymore. He's focused on all the things that could go wrong. So Jesus spends a lot of time training his closest disciples. How do you live in a fearful world without fear? How do you live where the instruments of faith, the hope that I bring, the love that I share with the world, how do you make those instruments more powerful than fear? And how, when there's fear all around you, can you push them aside so that you can be the people that God has chosen you to be, that God has made you to be? So I invite us to use those instruments, especially when we know we're afraid, to channel what it is to be God's hands and feet in the world, God's children.